Heather G. Cordova is a physical therapist. She has received her BS degree in kinesiology at UCLA and her MPT degree from USC. She has been practicing in the fields of physical therapy, primarily in orthopedics in both the private practices and hospital settings. She is currently a regional director and managing five hospital rehab settings. She is a board member of the orthopedics clinical specialist, certified strength and conditioning specialist, and a certified ergonomist. shorter than that other <laughs> So um, while they're getting me set up, just so you guys know, um, this will feel very boring compared to people dying from cardiac arrest and people breaking their neck uh, and people having severe concussions. We're just going to talk about knees, which are a bummer, but uh, it's not going to kill you, so that's good. So, you know, there's some pretty interesting data about female athletes, and um, some of you guys, most of you guys in here actually uh, don't remember a time when girls weren't playing as many sports as boys, um, and actually, I'm proud to say I was only six when the Title IX passed, so uh, I don't remember it either. But you know, since 1972, there's been an enormous change in the way girls participate in sports. Um, so back in the day, it was a boy thing, right? Girls stood on the side and cheered and waited for the boyfriend to finish so they could put their jacket on, and that doesn't happen anymore. So in the last you know 40 some odd years, we've had huge changes. And so it used to be that one in every 27 girls plays a sport. Now it's two in five. Okay, so it's almost half. It's crazy how many girls play sports. So that puts us at about a 600% increase in women playing um, sports at college level in the last 40 years. We still don't get anywhere near the money, but that's a whole other lecture. We'll talk about that some other time. Okay. So that means that of the United States population, 36 million kids, 5 to 18 years old, are playing an organized sport. That's not the kids out screwing around in the parking lot. That's the kids playing organized, paid for sports, okay? And 52% of those are girls, so we're winning. There's more of us now. Uh, than boys. And the other thing we've seen is there's a huge increase in club and competitive um, sport play in the last few years. That's that's not 40 years worth, that's more like maybe 15, 20 years worth or less, but huge difference. And so what we're finding is it's now very acceptable behavior for girls to play really aggressive, really competitive sports. And you know, it's not on a slide, but on a side note, for a long time I played softball. I played on a co-ed team and I played on a girls team. Guess which team was more obnoxious? Girls team, way more aggressive, way more nasty, totally different sport, right? I think once we got let loose in the sports world, they got out of the fast. So it's pretty acceptable for us to play at a high level um, of sport. So nothing like starting a female lecture out with a picture of a boy, but um, <laughs> the reason this is up here, this is my friend's son, is um, what we're finding now is we used to have the days where you know, this is soccer, but it doesn't matter what sport. You know, little kids would play soccer, and it was basically a big group of bumblebees running around, and somebody would, like, kind of kick the ball, and most of them were over there picking the grass. That exists still, but those kids are, like, two now, right? So this kid is four. And I want you just to look at not only how engaged in the sport he is, right, in the, that picture, what is that? Your right-hand picture. But also, if you just look at his kick on the left picture, that's not a bumblebee kick. That's a kick. Right? I mean, he's got full body engagement in this, and we see the exact same thing in girls. So it's really interesting now how the age at which kids are playing the sport like it's supposed to be played has come way, way, way down. Okay? Okay, so here's some interesting statistics. We don't want the girls to stop playing, right? I mean, that would be a bad plan. We just got to figure out how to keep these girls from hurting themselves while they play. And I found these kind of shocking. So for us, this was a study of female high school athletes, and it was one of those brain institutes that likes to collect like, massive amounts of data and analyze it. Um, girls are 92% less likely to be involved in drugs if they play a sport. That's a gigantic number, right? They're 80% less, less likely to get pregnant, because they don't have time to get pregnant. Um, they're three times more likely to graduate from high school, and the odds of a girl now playing high school soccer getting a full ride to a D1 or a D2 school is one in 90. That's a, that's a lot, right? One in 90 is a lot of players. So the, the bottom line is we don't want these kids to change the way they play. We just got to figure out a way to keep them from getting hurt while they play. This is really, sports has opened up a whole new world for, for most female athletes. Okay, so the question then becomes why do we see so many more injuries in girls? And that's really where things are confusing. Um, the data is not confusing. There are way more injuries in female athletes. Uh, there's no question about that, especially when you talk about the knee. Um, and so, you know, why does that happen? And we know that girls are generally lower tone, lower muscle tone than boys. Um, so I was trying to find a girl with busting here, but I don't see any of them. But usually, 
there's a lot of girls that are just really like they're slumpy they're kind of what we call hanging out on their ligaments right so like i'm pretty good at it so you can just kind of like let these ligaments hold you up you don't have to actually use any muscle i know you, i know none of you teenage girls who have ever done this but you know sit like this um girls tend to be a lot more at risk for disordered eating problems and so that's a real issue with athletes because um it creates all kinds of muscle mass loss bone mass loss um heart, uh, you know, endurance changes. And the sports that have really higher body image things are even worse with us. So cheerleading, um, gymnastics, um, those kinds of swimming, diving, those kinds of sports. So um, cheerleading, I think, unless you're a cheerleader, people don't realize the athletic components of cheerleading. I think people do now, but for a long time they didn't realize the level of athleticism that cheerleaders are displaying. Now it's pretty obvious, you know, if you can do 14 flips down the field, that probably takes a little athletic skill. But even before they were doing that kind of stuff, the demand for cheerleading was really, really high. If you're combining that with not eating well, not eating correctly, um, or causing your body to do weird things but to make yourself skinny, that's a huge problem, okay? And then the other huge um, challenge that a lot of people give some credence to is just the changes in Q angles. So just in case, I don't know what everyone's background is here, but your Q angle is basically the angle between your femur and your tibia, right? So women have a wider pelvis, so your femur comes in narrower to get to your knee, right? And then your leg goes straight down. And so for boys, that's a more straight line. For women, that's a sharper angle. Make sense? And so what happens with that is that the ligaments are in a different position. Okay. So this is just a laundry list of kind of really common knee injuries in women and girls, and we're going to go through them um, at a slower rate, of course. But double femoral problems are a huge problem we see. So the thing I hate about that is that is a completely garbage pail term. It's kind of like saying someone has a headache. Okay. You can tell me why they have a headache. So what does patellofemoral problem mean? That means something happened between here and here. That's what that means to me. Something's wrong right here. That's not a diagnosis. What does that mean, right? So we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what does that mean. And I can tell you probably two, maybe one to two out of every 10 prescriptions I get for a knee injury actually has a diagnosis on it that I would call a diagnosis. All the rest say patellofemoral injury, tracking problem, <coughs> You know, just, just crazy terms that don't mean anything to anybody. So we have to decide, is this person who's got a patellar instability? Is there a patella flying all over the place? Is this a person who has the opposite problem, who has a global patellar pressure problem where maybe they had an injury or a surgery and now nothing moves enough? Is it a plica problem where um, the folds of the, of the lining of your joint become uh, kind of in your way, create a space occupying thing? Is it a fat pad problem? Um, so those are biggies and we kind of break those down. ACL tears and ACL injuries are the thing everybody likes to talk about with female knee injuries, and they are a huge problem. They're not the only problem, but they are a huge problem. And then apophysitis, which is just a big word for saying that you have an inflammation where the, the bones are still growing, right? So you can have um, an apophysitis at your tibial tuberosity, the bump right here. You can have it at the patellar end, so that's not as good slide. We've got different names. We don't know why we like to attach people's last names to injuries in healthcare, but we do. Um, and so those are all really, really common. So we'll start with patellofemoral. So, um, like I said, the big thing is figuring out what is it? What are you actually treating? What are you really looking at? And um, that's sort of the, the golden secret in physical therapy and in, in medicine is figuring out what's really causing the symptoms. There's been a lot of studies, I read one study that I think is absolutely insane, where a physician let his partner physician scope his knee without any anesthetic so they can determine whether or not um, certain parts of the stroke, I know, <laughs> your face is closed, that's how I read it, like it's going up. Um, to determine what caused pain, right? So they so they literally put a scope in this guy's knees and poked around in different areas, poked back his patella, poked his meniscus, poked his ligaments, poked all this different stuff, and then they just, and then he said, I feel that here, or I feel that there, or I can't feel that. And what they determined was, it was really hard to identify what structure was causing the pain. He could identify whether it was one out of 10 or 10 out of 10 pain, and I'm sure there was a lot of language flying through this research lab while they were doing this, but they could, he could not easily localize, your, your probe is pushing on the back of my patella or your probe is pushing on my medial meniscus, or I feel like you're, and this is, I mean, the guy knows his anatomy too, right? He's another surgeon, and so he knew what to call everything, and he still couldn't really determine where things were coming from. We think that's why we get this really vague knee presentation, and so we'll, we'll palpate somebody, and we just can't figure out exactly what's happening, because they can't figure out what's happening. They can tell you usually, mechanically, when I do, when I bend and shift this way, this thing happens, 
and if we know our biomechanics well enough, sometimes we can figure it out. But they can't, you can't go by what somebody tells you where it hurts, right? I, it hurts right here doesn't mean I'm torn my medial meniscus, or you know, there's something wrong with my medial collateral ligament, or even that it's in my knee at all, because it might be that my sartorius is mad and that's just where it's attached. You know, there's tons of stuff. Um, tendonitis are a huge problem in the knee. We're gonna go through some pictures and I'll give you better examples. Um, but I would say that that's probably the biggest thing we see more than the, the true joint mechanics problems. Um, excessive lateral pressure syndrome. So those are all the girls, mostly girls, some boys, I've seen a couple boys, um, that have lateral releases done. So those are people who um, the physician determines has too short of uh, uh, structures on the outside of their knee and so their patella is drifting laterally and so um, it makes sense to just cut those things and the patella will go back. Does that make sense to anybody else if you don't? It makes no sense to you. So guess what? It doesn't go back. It goes, oh cool, I get more movement. I'm still going to hang on over here on the side. It, it doesn't work. Um, so there are some lateral, I mean, there are lateral releases that work. Don't read me wrong. But not very many of them. Most of them are, are pretty much a mess um, and still need to be fixed after the, they've had that lateral release. Global patellar syndromes are, are people who usually have had either a pretty significant direct trauma to the knee or a surgical um, procedure to the knee. And what happens is your body kind of fills in all that tissue, the scar tissue, and pretty soon nothing moves very well. And we see that in girls a lot, which is odd because everything else on most girls is pretty loosey-goosey. And then you get to this knee joint and everything's kind of glued together. Um, and so the opposite of that then is those in unstable people. And that's probably the most common thing we see. Those are the girls that um, can kind of, you know, just pick up their kneecap and you know, put it over here, or put it over there, exaggerate. <laughs> but it's really gross how much they can move their kneecap. Um, and so, what do we do with these people? I've got some, some terms in here that might not everybody might not know, so I'll try to do fast definitions of them. We're gonna look at the blue player. That's Brooklyn, you can call it Brooklyn. Um, and so, what I want you to look at, a couple of things are, um, look first at her left knee, so her forward knee, right? Don't look at the red player yet. So on her forward knee, what you see is ground reaction force. So just ground reaction force, does everybody know that word? So essentially, her body's driving into the ground and the ground is hitting her back with an equal and opposite force, right? Those of you still in high school that thought you would never use physics again, sorry, you're gonna use it again. So um, that ground reaction force, if you think about the arrow that it would create right here, coming up like this, right? That angle that that would create would ca is causing a really high knee flexion torque, right? It's trying to bend her knee. Does that make sense to everybody? She's working really hard to keep from that knee bending, right? Because she's got all of her body weight, her center of gravity, in other words, that's what COG is, is way, way, way behind her foot, right? So the demand on Brooklyn right now is, don't let my don't let my knee bend, because she's gonna fall on her butt, right? Don't let my knee bend, and um, don't let this girl in the red push me over, right? So the girl in the red's pushing sideways, um, and, and oh, by the way, while I'm at that, I guess we'll just kick this ball right here, right? So she's got a huge array of demands on her knee. So um, the real issue for me here is she actually looks really good, right? So Brooklyn's actually a good player. There's nothing wrong with her position in this picture. But what I want you to think about is if she was in this position for six games in two days, the demand on her patellar tendon is huge, right? It's screaming bloody murder by the end of this weekend, right? And so she's a perfect candidate for patellar tendonitis if everything else isn't working very well, right? This is exact, kind of exactly how they get developed. Um, and then, just for fun, she also has the player on the right, um, or on, what is that? Yeah, on her right, pushing her to the side, right? She's doing a really, really good job, if you look at her trunk, of maintaining a neutral trunk, so the load goes through her trunk and not through her knee. This is why Brooklyn doesn't have a bad knee yet, right? Not yet, she's not going to, because she knows the hand off the letter. Okay, so she's pushing, she's getting pushed to the side by that player, and so that player is creating that lateral torque, and she's also having to lean to the side. Um, and then just for fun, if you look at the difference of the red player and her knee, the way she's landing with her forward leg, she's got her body weight, her center gravity, right over her foot. By the time her foot hits the ground, she's she's got no load at all, right? She's, she's, a, she's playing defense, she's not having to, to reach out for that ball, okay? So huge difference in the way these two girls' knees are demanding. Don't forget, these are 10 year olds. Look at their position, look how hard they're playing. Can you imagine what these girls are gonna look like in high school, right? If they can make it to high school without screwing themselves up, that'd be great. 
Okay, so let's look at another one. So what I wanted to point out to you in this position is, um, again, I said she's a good player, she's in good position, but I want you to notice a couple of things. She has her hip, her knee, and her ankle all pretty much in line, right? She's got really good mechanics in this position. Her pelvis is level. Her hips are relatively level, which is extremely hard for young girls to maintain. Young girls have crappy hip strength. They have cruddy trunk strength. They're weak. She doesn't look very weak, but generally speaking, for the amount of load they're putting on their body, they're really weak, okay? Um, so, but there's some real challenges for her, potentially. If you look just down at her foot, her forward foot, she's landing really hard on the outside of her foot, right? So there's a lot of lateral load. So she's got a couple of options. One is um, she carries her body weight through and nothing happens. Two is uh, she misses how that heel lands and she twists her ankle, which is pretty common, right? Three is the real risk for her in this in this picture, and nothing happened in this kick, by the way, um, is if that cleat gets stuck. And this is what we see a lot. So if that cleat gets stuck in the grass, if you look at Brooklyn, her kick force with her left leg is going to cause her to rotate really strong toward the right. Does everybody see that? Okay. So she's going to rotate really hard to the right, which is totally fine as long as her foot goes with her. But if her foot doesn't go with her, which is the real risk in this position, um, then she's got a real um, significant risk of ACL problems, right? Because she's got all kinds of rotatory force taking place. Um, I think I mentioned already, but her hips are important. It's rare to see uh, a young girl be able to stabilize their hips like that. So most of the time what you'd see is her right leg would look like it looks and her left leg would look like this. Would be, her left hip would be really low. Okay, this is not her, this is a teammate. Um, is anybody worried about that back knee? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not gonna clear the ground, okay? So a couple of things in this one. Um, look at the difference in this girl's front leg and in the in the valgus low, the, the angle of her knee, right? She's not stable over that leg at all, right? So she didn't get hurt either. She got lucky. But in this position, she has her hip way outside of where her knee is. Um, part of that, I'm, I'm sort of cheating. I mean, she obviously, I don't know exactly what she did. I don't know if she blocked that ball or, or what's happening in this picture. Um, but again, I'm, this is a stop frame and she kept moving, so it might not be as bad as I'm making it sound, but I want to use it as an example, that the rotation force in her front knee is humongous based on her body position. She's doing a pretty good job of balancing it out, right? She's rotated really far the other way, so she's not falling over, and I'm sure she didn't fall over in this picture, um, but there's a lot of risk to the front knee, and then that's if we just pretend not to pay attention to that back knee, which is for sure about to slam into the ground. There's no question about that. And so. These are the kids that we see that kind of blunt force trauma on the knee joint that can create all kinds of inflammatory problems. Um, and what happens is she'll stand up, she'll brush it off, right? She'll wipe the grass off, she'll keep playing. And then she'll, she'll be there and then she'll do this a little while later and she's already smashed her patellar tendon into the ground and now she puts this kind of load on it, right? And so that's where we start seeing injuries. Okay. And then let's look at this girl. So this isn't Brooklyn either, it's another teammate. Um, let's look at her back leg first. So her back leg, she's in a lot of knee flexion, right? Tons of knee flexion. Um, and again, it's a stop frame. She probably didn't hang out there very long. But still, she's in a lot of knee flexion in that knee. And um, my concern for her really is that her center of gravity, or where her body weight is kind of amassed, if you put it into a straight line, is quite a bit behind her knee joint as well. So she has a huge amount of load on her patellar tendon in this picture. Um, she also needs probably more trunk strength than an average 10 year old has to get back over going forward again. Because what, the, the, what we call breaking force, the force that she's putting into the ground that is pushing her back the other direction from the way in which she's moving, her breaking force um, is really, really high in the position she's in. So she has to use a ton of trunk um, and a ton of hip flexion and a ton of abs to get that body back over her foot and moving forward again. So. She's got a couple of choices for that. She's got to use lots of abs, she's got to lose lots of glutes, and she's got to have that quad in the back hold her up while she's doing all that. And then just for fun, there's another nasty red player pushing her. Um, there's a, the red player is, is trying to push her toward the left, and so that's creating the opposite. It's a varus load on her knee in this position. So, I mean, these are just examples. There's about a zillion of them. It doesn't matter if these are soccer players. These same examples are in every other sport we see girls play. Um, these are just pictures I had easy access to. Uh, and so really, the trick becomes, you know, what do we do with these people? We know that 
that ACL injuries in girls are literally four to six times at least, um, I've read higher, um, than they are in, in boys. And so there's, there's plenty of research to show that there's a pretty significant lack of neuromuscular control in girls compared to boys. Um, what I mean by that is, do you know where you are in space? Do you control where you are in space? Are you, are you maintaining your body where you want it to be? And again, that comes from all of the things that I described before, lower tone, generally lower tone activity. And I'm even talking about the girls, I mean, there's girls that come into our clinic with washboard abs, and they still probably aren't strong enough for the sport they're playing, okay? Because the forces are so high. We see more than anything else, I think, uh, hip weakness in women and in young girls, um, that is a real issue. We see that lower extremity valgus, that Q angle that I told you about. Um, we also see an interesting phenomenon where uh, girls recoup their quads over their hamstrings much more than, than boys do. So in boys, you get a pretty even quad and hamstring contraction when you're trying to do something with the knee, when you lower the knee. And the reason that's important is the knee joint is gonna work best when it has a counter force, okay? So the quad's doing whatever it's doing and the hamstring's holding on and both sides are stabilizing. Just like if you're trying to hold up the pole, it's easier to hold it this way than hold it with one hand, right? So that's kind of what that, those muscles are designed to do. And for whatever reason, girls don't recruit their hamstring as well as they recruit their quad. And so that increase in quad firing that isn't balanced by the hamstring allows the knee to create a lot more shifting. So now the demand is higher for all the ligament structures. So if those quads and hands are firing like they're supposed to, the ligament demand is much lower. So ligaments are not there to stop all of your motion without muscle, okay? And if you take all the muscle off, you take a cadaver and you take all the muscle off and you just load all the ligaments, you, it's, it's very, very easy to take that knee apart. It doesn't take a lot of force. That's gross, sorry, but that's true, okay? And so that's what that muscle is designed to do. So what happens in girls, we think part of the reason they have more ACL injuries is their hamstring does not stop their tibia from going forward. So that's the load that tears the ACL, okay? And then also, um, there's, there's a lot of people who argue that that increase in joint laxity in general with menstrual cycles creates an even bigger risk. And there's actually been several studies that look at when in somebody's menstrual cycle did they tear the, their ACL, um, and it, it's very clear. So there's a lot of connection there. Since we can't solve that problem, we gotta figure out how to stabilize these girls. But if anybody figures out how to solve that problem, I'm good for listening to that story. Okay, so this is very scientific. This is my treatment guidelines. You pay attention, it's very scientific. You ready? Okay, if it's too tight, you have to stretch it. And if it's too loose, you have to make it fire or make it stronger, right? And if it's not firing, then you have to figure out a way to make it contract. And if it has really bad timing, then you improve that. So that's how you fix everybody. So that's all you need to know. Just memorize that. <laughs> that's it. I'm done. No, I'm not done. Um, so what does that really mean? I mean, obviously, you've got to reduce swelling, right? So if you can't get swelling down in the knee, you have a very hard time getting in the muscle structures to fire. So the body is really, really good at um, self-limiting. So if you get enough swelling in your joint, in any joint, not just the knee, your nervous system goes, mm, something's wrong here. So yeah, none of you guys get to work anymore. We're all just going to chill, right? And so the problem is, people don't chill. They still try to use those joints. And so trying to exercise or even walk or move around on a swollen joint is a real problem because you don't have the ability to recruit those muscles like you should. So we've got to get the swelling down. Obviously, we have to reduce pain. Um, that's kind of a no-brainer. We do that in a, in a ton of ways in physical therapy, different different um, treated styles, do it different ways. Uh, I use a lot of pain units, I use a lot of ice. Um, I use a lot of taping techniques that kind of inhibit pain, things like that. You gotta get volitional control back. So I talked about that. If you And you kinda gotta do this in order, because if you have too much swelling, you don't have a prayer of getting the muscles to contract again. So you gotta control the swelling and you gotta control the pain first. But then you can work on restoring um, volitional control, getting muscles to fire the way you need them to fire so that um, you can stabilize that. Emphasizing, obviously, that quad and hamstring um, balance we talked about. And then, and only then, do you start working toward progressing somebody back um, to activity. So what we find is that, like I said, you know, you didn't break your neck and you didn't die of cardiac arrest. And, you know, you're 15 and you're going to the nationals and so your parents paid a lot of money already and everybody's kind of in the same camp going, well, do you think you can play? Do you think you can play? Do you think you can play? And eventually you go, yeah, I think I can play. Um, and, you know, I mean, I'm not any better, and I'm 29 years old, and then, you know, I've done a lot of sports I shouldn't do because I was injured and I played anyway. So it's not a kid thing, it's just a human being thing. Um, and so it's really, really important that, that things get controlled um, and the way that people progress back to a sport. So um, I think we're, we really blow it in, in 
treating these girls and treating anybody really but these girls is is not limiting them from going back until they're ready so in my opinion um, if you need a quick and dirty assessment of whether you want to put your kid back in or you're you're the coach and you want to put your player back in um, you need to make sure your player can control their position in space so that's why my model's here okay can you hear me if I back away from that I've never been known for being quiet okay so you can put a kid up on these, up on a step or up on a stool or up on a whatever. If that child, that adult, that whoever cannot, cannot keep their pelvis level and step all the way off the step, they're not ready, period, okay? I don't care if it's a hip injury, a knee injury, an ankle injury, I can guarantee you that player is going to get hurt again. They can't lower themselves down. So I can promise you we're gonna do a lot more than that in therapy, but if you're on the sidelines and you're trying to decide or, or you have what you suspect to be, uh, you know, the classic um, Southern California sports parent trying to get you your player by, check it out, right? Just see, can my player even do that? Or can your player stand on one foot and not look like this? Not look like this. Can your player stay here, right? Can your player keep their pelvis level? If they can't, do not let that person play. I don't care what the sport is, except maybe swimming, right? Because you, you can... I'm a swimmer, I'm allowed to say it. Um, you can use your uppers, right? It's really, really important. So what we find often when we look at girls versus boys is um, it's pretty rare other than like a brand new, you know, fracture or weird injury. It's pretty rare for me to find a boy who can't keep their pelvis level when they step down. It's extremely common in girls not to be able to do this. And they go that, like this. I'm grossly exaggerating so you can see, right? But they do this weird pelvic thing to get down. Which some people just do as a habit. But if you say no, you've got to put your fingers right here and don't change this level, and they still can't do it. They don't have enough strength to be anywhere near whatever your field, court, pool, whatever it is. Keep them out of it, okay? What we find when girls, um, when, we, when we really increase the load even more, I don't exercise them today, when you ask them to actually jump off something, so just, just jump off it and land, okay? I'm gonna try to be a boy and then a girl. Won't be easy, but okay. Here's a boy, watch my knees. What do they do? They just went right over my feet, right? I just, I just kind of collected the force and then stood back up. This is a gross exaggeration. Girls, do not be offended, okay? I don't even know if I can do it. Right? Okay, I'm totally exaggerating. But it's really easy to see when you ask a girl to jump off of something. If they are collapsing like that, they don't have a lot, enough control to actually be um, in any kind of normal or neutral propeller alignment. It just can't happen, right? Mechanically, there's too much force. I don't care if she only weighs 67 pounds. It doesn't matter. It's still really high force. Remember, just walking, you're hitting the ground about three or four times your body weight. Running, six, eight, depends on how you run from sin, your body weight. A lot, a lot, a lot of force. So you need to really think about what kind of position you're letting these girls play in. Okay. So like I said, it's really, really important that you get that dynamic control back for your for your um, athlete before you let them on the field, or even you know let them do a lot of activity. I mean, I'll have people who say, well, you know, I'm a soccer player and um, coach says I can't play because I did this thing or that thing to my knee. So I'm just I just ran five miles a day instead. That's a great option, right? I mean, so so it's it's about really having people understand what the demand is on their knee and how they get that demand um, balanced with the with with what they're doing in their training program. Um, like I said, the biggest mistake I see people make is they treat the knee when it's a knee injury. Sounds stupid, right? You can't treat the knee. I mean, you get to treat the knee, but treating the knee if you don't treat the hip in a female, especially, is useless. Right, because I have seen. I'm really. I'm a. I'm a distance runner. I'm in a running club. Um, I've had really good runners come into my clinic before that know me personally, and um, and are you know six, six and a half, seven minute milers over a marathon. You know, good runners, and they won't be able to bridge. Does everybody know what bridges? Lay on your back, bend your knees, and pick your butt up. They can't bridge, or they can bridge twice. That's scary, right? How are these people doing that? but they are now sitting in my clinic because something hurts, right? Because they don't have enough hip strength. So you cannot look at a girl um, and, and treat only the knee and not look at the hip. It's just a disaster. I've never seen it work one time yet. Um, the same is really true with the ankle. Sometimes, occasionally we see an issue that's really ankle that looks like knee, but usually it's hip. 
And like I told you, most young girls are super, super weak in the hip. Um, the knee just doesn't have a fighting shot at all if you don't treat it. Um, so always think about looking at proximal structures. That's true also, you know, like if you're treating an elbow and you don't look at the shoulder, you're not gonna stay in practice very long. Nobody's gonna get better, right? It's a huge problem. Okay, that's what I have to say. Thank you.